Oh, what a story we have to share with the world. What a message of hope and joy and redemption. That message is Jesus. Jesus is the reason we've gathered here today, and we've met in this place to lift our praise, to raise our voices and worship God and his most precious gift, his son, Jesus Christ, who was born to give us everlasting life. Historically, Christmas has been a story of worship. It's a story of bowed heads and upraised hands as God's people awaited the coming Messiah. Christmas is a story of praise. It's a story of an angel, a young Nazarene girl, and a heavenly promise. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus. And so Mary responded in praise, worshiping God and saying, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit is rejoiced in God my Savior. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Does your soul exalt the Lord today? Does your spirit rejoice in God our Savior? The mighty one has done great things. He has given us his son. With a heavenly word, name of a beautiful promise from a fallen world. You will give birth to a son, the child of the most holy one. He is wonderful. 
He's our counselor. And Jesus, and Jesus, and Jesus, and Jesus, 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 and Jesus, call his name Jesus. And so. Jesus entered our world in a small town, not with earthly power or position, but in the simplicity of manger, not with thunder or thunderous fanfares, but possibly just a young mother's soft lullaby and a father's quiet smile. However, on a hill over Bethlehem, it would not stay quiet for long. Shepherds were awakened by a brilliant light and joyous angelic declaration. Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. So the shepherds ran to find the Savior that had been born for them in a manger. And there they knelt, and they offered the praise of their lips and the worship of their hearts. Thank you. 
Praise can be explosive like thunder and fill the sky with voices of a thousand angels. Or they can be hushed and reverent like a prayer. And they can sing their song in a listening heart. You see, there was a righteous man in Jerusalem named Simeon. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he wouldn't die until he saw the Lord's Christ. At the appropriate time after his birth, when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple to present him to the Lord, Simeon took the baby in his arms. He praised God, saying, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light a revelation to the Gentiles, and a glory to your people, Israel.
Well, praise the Lord, praise the Lord indeed. It is so helpful to have wonderful music to remind us of wonderful truths that direct our hearts towards the Lord. Now, I do want to tell you that is only half of the cantata. After the message, the choir will return and present the other half of the cantata. Uh, but for now, this morning, we'll be looking at Mary's response to God's message that she will indeed give birth to the Messiah. So we're going to be reading in Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 55. So if you want to turn your Bible, feel free to do so. There's one under the chair in front of you on page 44 in the back section, or it will also be on the screen for you. But before we get to Mary's response and our, our key passage this morning, I want to first read the portion where the initial message was delivered to Mary by the angel Gabriel. In Luke chapter 1, verse 26, it states, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said, her, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at the statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He'll be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. Mary was a young girl whom the Lord chose to bless with the gift of being the one to give birth to the Messiah. And she conceived a child by the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit, which shows that this child is not like any other child. This child will be born for a purpose greater than any other children. And at the culmination of this truth, Mary responds in faith, believing the message, and she responds in the form of a song, a hymn, something that is quite fitting for our time here at the Cantata. This song is often referred to as the Magnificat. It's a song of praise to, to magnify the Lord for what he has done. Please listen as I read our main passage today. Luke 1, 46 to 55. And Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation towards those who, who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their throne and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with, with good things. And sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. In short, Mary's response ought to be our response. You see, Mary worships the Lord she exalts the Lord. She, she magnifies the Lord. And throughout her song, she highlights truths about God that lead her to rejoicing. And my hope, as you're uplifted by the songs today, my hope is that you'll also be reminded of three powerful truths that you will take with you in your heart, in your mind, and that you will especially remember this whole month and rejoice in the Lord all throughout Christmas time. As we take in the Christmas cantata today, 
let's consider three reasons why our hearts should worship Christ. The first reason is that the Lord is powerful. Many believe God is powerful enough. I'm sorry, Mary believes God is powerful enough to do what he says he's going to do. The Lord loves to show his power through the weak and the seemingly vulnerable. She views herself as a humble bondservant of the Lord. She believes in the Lord's power and she responds in worship. She says, the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy is upon generation after generation towards those who fear him. God has shown his power in Mary's life. She has conceived a child as a virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is amazing, unparalleled. It shows the power of God. Mary is exalting in the power of God at work in her life. And she is excited that she is a part of what God is doing. She believes in his power. She says the Lord's name is holy. He is unlike anyone else. He is lifted up above everyone else. He can do things that nobody else can do. He brings about life where it seems like there can be no life. And that leads to her rejoicing and exulting in the Lord. How has God shown his power in your life? How has God shown his mighty power through you? Has he taken things that on the surface seem impossible? Has he taken trials and difficulty and challenges? And has he used those situations to remind you about what Christ has done for you? Does he use those situations to refine you to become more like Jesus Christ? Does he use those situations to give you a platform to share the good news with others in a powerful way? I want to encourage you this whole month. I want to encourage you to reflect on Jesus coming to earth and showing God's power through the virgin birth. And then look for ways the Lord is working in your life to show his power in unexpected ways through you to point to Christ. It's easy to focus on all the things we want to get done and all the things we can't get done around the holidays. And yet God is working to draw men, women, and children to himself. He's working in and through followers of Christ, becoming more like Jesus and spreading the good news of salvation. And so we must daily consider the, the power of the Lord that is at work. And we must see it as a blessing that we get to be a part of what God is doing. It's a blessing to be a part of something that powerful. Mary viewed herself as blessed. In addition to the Lord's power, we also worship the Lord because the Lord is merciful. The Lord does not use his power like so many people use their power. He uses his power to bring about justice, righteousness, and mercy, and compassion. It says his mercy is upon generation after generation towards those who fear him. The Lord is merciful. He brings low those who are prideful. In his mercy, he raises up the lowly, those who fear him. He shows compassion to those who are not strong those who do not trust in themselves, but trust in him. And Mary is a prime example of this. She has a rich understanding of who God is and what he has done for his people. She says he's given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy. He spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. Israel was not in a position of power and God rescued them from the Exodus, from Egypt. He showed compassion and brought them to the promised land. 
Mary is not in a position of power, but God shows her mercy. He shows her compassion to meet her greatest need, and this leads to rejoicing. Mary humbles herself and rests in God's compassion, not in her own strength and power. She views herself as a bondservant of the Lord. And she views this as a blessing that she is going to be used of the Lord. And she's going to be exalted. And yet she humbled herself. She says, he has regarded for the humble state of his bond slave. Behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. God showed mercy in Mary's life. How has God shown his mercy in your life? How has he provided for you in small ways and in big ways? Do you remember the first time you heard the gospel? Maybe a parent or a friend or a Sunday school teacher talked to you about your sin and your need for God's mercy. They began talking to you about Jesus. Our sin brings us low. But the Lord lifts us up with good news of his love that's not based on works, but based on his mercy, his compassion, when did he show you his mercy? And how did that bring you the, the greatest blessing in all of the world? Security in heaven for all time and eternal life with him forever. If you've never experienced God's mercy in your life, I want to encourage you to humble yourself today. Admit that you need a Messiah just like Mary did. She knew that she needed a Savior. Admit your need and receive God's mercy that is brought in by faith in trusting what Jesus did for you, dying on the cross as an act of compassion and mercy towards you that you do not deserve and could not ever earn. Believing friend, this whole month, I want to encourage you to humble yourself daily. Make sure you remind yourself of when you first heard of God's mercy and how much you still need it. Humble yourself daily and remember how God has worked in your life, showing you his mercy unto salvation and daily showing you his mercy, providing you with your everyday needs because he wants to use you as a, a conduit of his mercy towards others. Lastly, the third reason to worship the Lord is because the Lord is the Savior. Mary starts her song rejoicing in God's character. The character of our God is that he saves he is a delivering God. He's a God who, who rescues, who pursues, and provides. A God who sees the needy and lifts them up and places their feet on solid ground. Mary recognized that she needed the Lord to save her. Luke 1.47, my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. After this sentence, God is the subject of every verb in this song. And the question is, is God the subject of every aspect of your life? Has he brought salvation into your life? And therefore, is he your life? His power is is unparalleled. His mercy is beyond compared, and he has a plan of salvation that we do not deserve, that he provides freely as a gift to all those who will place their trust in him. It's true for Mary, true for Israel, and it even goes back to Abraham and all the way forward to us. You see, Abraham is the father of faith. He trusted God's word and it was credited to him as righteousness. Because of his faith in what God had said and promised, he was in a right standing before God. 
he also trusted that he was going to be a part of God's plan. And he miraculously had a child that pointed forward and connects to the ultimate miracle child that Mary is going to have. And through that messianic line of Abraham, all those who trust by faith in the Lord will indeed be blessed. And this blessing is the ultimate blessing of salvation, being delivered from the greatest enemy, being delivered from the power and the penalty of sin and death, the blessing of being given new life where seemingly life could not exist. But because of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, the Messiah, who had to come to be born of a virgin, to live a perfect life, and to die in our place, our sin can be forgiven. The book of Hebrews makes a great connection to Abraham and why Jesus had to become a man, to be, to be born so that he can be, bring salvation to mankind. Notice this last passage or second to last passage that speaks about how God helps the descendant of Abraham, not just his biological children, but all those who place their trust in the Lord and become children of the promise. Hebrews 2, 14 through 18. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. The Lord is the Savior. He gives help to the descendant of Abraham. He took on flesh and gives help by dying a real physical death in order to defeat death. He brings life. He brings salvation to all those who trust that Jesus came, was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life and died on the cross and rose from the grave. The Lord is the only one who can do this. The Lord is the only one who can save. And it's not by works, not by some complicated process, but by confessing who Jesus is and believing the word of God just like Mary did, just like Abraham did. I'll close with Romans 10, 9 and 10. It says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord... And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified. With the mouth one confesses and is saved. I pray that you take from this message the truths that the Lord is powerful. The Lord is merciful. And the Lord is the only Savior. And he showed that most supremely through the person and work of Jesus. And that is why we are to worship him this day, every day in December, and every day until he returns. May we exalt him today and each day until we see him face to face. Let's pray to that end, shall we? Lord, we want to recognize your great power. We want to recognize, Lord, that you are able to do things that we cannot do. Lord, we have no power in our own strength, our own righteousness, our own goodness, because even our good deeds are but filthy rags before you, our holy God. Lord, your power is beyond compare, and we need it. Lord, your mercy 
is amazing because we don't deserve it. Lord, in your power, you could destroy us sinners. But in your mercy, you chose to to lift us up. You chose to show your compassion and your love for your enemies, those who hate you. Lord, help us never, never forget how much we needed you and how much we need you every day. Lord, help us to rejoice in your mercy that was shown so supremely by sending your son to take on flesh, to be born of a virgin, to live a perfect life so that you could be the the perfect sacrifice in our place. And Lord, help us rejoice in your salvation. Help us to be viewing it as being blessed that we get to be a part of it, both as being saved and also to share this good news of salvation with others. Lord, I pray that for the rest of our service, you would be exalted. Lord, we pray this in the powerful, merciful, saving name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, as we continue our celebration of the birth of Jesus, listen again to how God's people responded to the news of Jesus' birth. Mary started by saying, My soul exalts the Lord. The angels then sang, glory to God in the highest. And Simeon proclaimed, my eyes have seen your salvation, the glory of your people Israel. So how else can we respond but to say, glory to God in the highest. Gloria in excelsis Deo.
of the chief reasons that the birth of Jesus is good news is because he's the promised Emmanuel. Now, all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. We were created to be with God and fellowship with him, but that fellowship was broken as soon as sin entered the world. God is holy, and no amount of moral effort or good deeds could ever wash the sin away and raise us up to him. No, he had to come down to us. Praise God for Emmanuel. He alone is worthy of our praise. God is with us. Praise God for Emmanuel. 
in this act of giving us his own son, God showcased the depth of his love for us. See, in this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We worship God today for the depth of his glorious love.
Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, today we've been celebrating the power, mercy, the saving love you demonstrated by sending your son to redeem us. Lord, I pray that we would leave changed today for those here who have never trusted in Jesus, his life, death, resurrection for the forgiveness of their sins. We pray that today would be the day they bow the knee to King Jesus and ask him to forgive and save them. Lord, for those of us who are followers of Christ, open our eyes, our hearts ever more fully to see your beauty, your glory in the person of Christ. Jesus, you are the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the Holy One who has purchased our victory and redemption with your blood. Jesus, you are worthy of all blessing, honor, glory, and power. We declare it today and we will sing it for eternity when we're with you forever. Let it be so. Amen.
Thank you for coming. You are dismissed. Curse is found, for as the curse is found.